Mm-hmm. Okay, everyone, I'm Nisha. Hi. It's the last presentation of the day. You guys made it. I'm so proud of everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about water data and the uh, data project for India Water Portal. Um, okay. Um, so water data is a uh, fragmented and we don't know what all exists basically um, so it hasn't been evaluated and we don't really know what the whole picture looks like um, it basically puts us in a position where we don't know what uh, what kind of water information is known and what are things like where are the gaps that maybe civil society or other people can fill because government hasn't been very good at putting all their data in one place so we can all find it. It's a common problem across all sectors. It just happens to be um, a fairly big problem in the water sector as well. And if we don't know what's there, we can't really ask them to improve the way they collect data and we can't really figure out what's missing. So we're under the impression pretty much all the time that they don't have anything and that we have to start from scratch every time. So I'll get to that a little bit later. So the problem is large and really unmanageable. Data is this huge problem, especially government data, especially something like water or any kind of science or like, you know, utility information that people need across all spectrums. It's just a, it's just unmanageable to figure out how do we get this essential resource to everyone, make sure it's high quality water, uh, do we do 24-7, these types of things, where do we get the water from, um, what's wrong with it if you get it from the ground, if you collect rainwater, where, where are the issues and where, how do you set up a system so that people are covered pretty much all the time. So the solution for us, this is the Indian Water Portal stance, is that you kind of have to uh, break it up into small chunks. And this is how we hopefully will tackle some of the problems. So you have to kind of ask the question, how much water is needed to meet the demand of all water use? We actually don't know how much water we use. <clears throat> no, one, no one knows. It's not like the US knows or Europe knows, but they have a much better idea since most of their uh, domestic use and industrial use is metered and monitored by the EPA and various other places. Um, here there are no meters and people don't really track their their water use domestically and the industry is not really required to say how much they're using in an honest manner. If anything is known, agriculture is the best known in terms of how much they use to irrigate. but. There is a huge gap in how much water we're, we're using. Um, and how much water is available for us to use. It's also something no one really knows for sure. There are different issues um, depending on where your water source is. And no one knows exactly how much water is in the ground, how much we're using, obviously. So if you don't know how much we're using, how much is in the ground, you don't know how much is left. You don't know how much water gets recharged in the ground um, after a rain or through surface water or anything. These are um, things that kind of we take for granted a little bit. But in terms of data, in terms of hard facts about what's being used, we uh, there isn't. Um, it's an unknown. Government schemes and what they're how they're implementing. Um, some of this is known, but it's done by a project basis, not an overall sort of funding um, implementation model where you kind of get a good idea of what is the impact of a government scheme in terms of providing water. So this information isn't really well known, and the states are required to collect this information and distribute it, and it's unclear how, how much they do um, in terms of accurate reporting of, of this data. So IWP, Indian Water Portal, is a content warehouse for water information. Um, and they started a data project. So the data project aims to understand what water data exists 
and create a community around using that water uh, data to enhance projects, um, build better advocacy, and basically just get a better idea of what's going on um, with what we're using in terms of water use and what we need. Um, so the data project, just real quick, it's a pilot phase right now. We're doing a lot of research. We found 200 data sets online. So there is water data that exists online. We just didn't know it was there. Um, and it's trapped in PDFs and not very easy to find or to really use in any kind of way. Uh, one of the first projects we did would take 100 years of rain uh, climate change data and put it online. We created this little tool. <clears throat> you can put in uh, what state, what district, what type of data you want from what time frame within those 100 years, and you can generate a graph. It's pretty nifty, you know, see what, uh, what's happening. You can also download the data. Um, so people have used it to do rainwater harvesting projects and various other things. Um, and people have also used it, like Thage, to create this little thing where it's called Isle of Bangalore. And you can slide it up and down. And it tells you the, the temperature and how Bangalore has the best temperature. Anand S showed you this in the morning. Um, and then we created the data finder. So after we found these 200 sources of data, we added metadata to it. So now you can actually search and find the source. You can actually download. You can have, you can download some data, but not all of it. And this is a way we hope to tackle the uh, finding the data part. Um, it's not so much open yet, but at least we all know where most of it is now, um, which is a huge step forward. So in terms of um, let's get this one. one, okay. Sorry, you had a question? No. Um, just real quick, the data project is, is five tracks. Um, we're going after data research, which is discovering the data sources. We're going after some of those data sources and putting them into Excel formats. So converting PDFs into Excel, scraping websites, these types of things. Uh, we created a platform, and we're also going to share data across multiple platforms community building, events like this, and other uh, events to get people to understand that this data exists and that people should start doing things with them. Um, and analysis, visualization, storytelling. That's the last component of what our project is doing. So the, 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 um, the data that we have, we don't know if it's good. This is the big question with government data. Primarily, government data is not good data. Um, but it's a theory. We don't actually know if that's true. We have no data to support or deny that statement. So as we kind of go through this data, <clears throat> find out what's going on. Things like, what's the methodology behind collection? What's, um, what is this data telling us? What kind of stories you can, you can get out of it? These are the things that largely government has controlled through reports and putting their data in PDFs and on offline formats. But when you release the data in an open format, now you're allowing other people to tell different stories. And that, like we said this morning, you have put layers upon it, and now we can find out if this data actually is useful to anyone. Or if government is now on an auto mode and just collecting data because they've collected data, and they're just going to continue to collect the same data over and over and over again, even though it's not primarily good. Um, this is something that uh, was developed in the U.S. called the transparency cycle. And it's one of the things that uh, we hope to go through with water data, but also all data. Um, there is a, a, there's multiple groups of people that, that um, should be uh, accessed when we're dealing with data. Um, it should be something that's not just for programmers or for um, researchers, but people like developers, engaged citizens, journalists um, as well should be using data in some way. And this is kind of the, the route it goes towards through from getting data from government to uh, using it to tell stories and using it to engage government again and to hopefully change policy. And that's kind of what the project hopes to go through this cycle. Um, 
to see if it actually works, basically, in India. Um, and see if, if you make data, if you do some data analysis and you ask questions, will government be responsive to it? Um, and we don't know the answer to that. So hopefully, as we go through the process, we can find that out for sure. Okay. Um, India water data. So the real problem with data and water data in particular is that government has large sets of data across the country, but it's not very granular. And NGOs will collect very granular data, but it's not very large in terms of scale. So for instance, government will collect statewide district level data and average it, and they will that's what they will release. Well, an NGO will collect for a couple of districts or for a state, it'll be very granular, and you can't compare the two. So ground truthing of government data can't really happen in an effective way. You can't tell if the data government is using is good because they give you such a wide uh, view of it that when you're trying to use data that you've collected, the methodologies are so different and the uh, view is so wide, you can't actually compare the two and find out if what your data says contradicts or agrees with government data. Um, so uh, Argan did a, a survey in 2009 in the state of Karnataka. It covered 28 districts, 17,000 households, and 172 franchises. It was a rural study, so urban data is not represented. Um, this is a very uh, crude graph comparing our data with what we collected with two government sources, the Central Groundwater Board and Drinking Water and Sanitation, the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation. Um, so this is samples, uh, percentage of samples contaminated with fluoride. Fluoride is a problem in this area. High levels of fluoride uh, cause fluorosis, which is affects your bones and teeth and causes um, crippling, I guess. Okay, that wasn't sensitive, I apologize. Um, so it's a huge problem in this area, and the Northeast arsenic is a huge problem. So uh, throughout the country, groundwater is very contaminated, and if you drink a lot of it, these types of things happen. Uh, sickness and disease happen. So the government keeps track of how much contamination is in, is in fluoride. So you look at these three lines. The blue line is CGWB. Um, they collect uh, samples from all over the country from a set number of wells. RPM sample, which is the NGO collection, and drinking water and sanitation, which is just a hub ministry that gets uh, sample uh, data from the states. So they don't actually go out and collect, they just get state level data. Um, you can see that it's these are very three kind of different lines. There's some connection, but if you live, let's say, um, it's not very good, uh, here, you don't actually know if your water is good or not. And it's hard to tell um, from this in particular which set of which set of data you should actually believe. Um, and this is kind of the problem, is that something as straightforward as how much fluoride is in water, which is a test that you can do and get a fairly accurate example, uh, actu accurate um, detection, um, you can't actually tell from the data provided whether your area is affected and you should be you should take precautions or not. Um, and we can't really, as our NGO data is not very compatible with the government data because our methodology was different and we don't know what methodology they used. What is their sample size? Is it representative of giving you a clear picture of what exactly is going on in the ground? How many villages were covered? How many households? Um, without doing that, without knowing that level of detail, it's hard to know if they're actually collecting data that is representative of what's happening on the ground. And considering people are getting sick, it's a, it's a problem that the government should be dealing with pretty head-on. <clears throat> and that's where NGOs and 
people on the ground want to keep their government accountable to something, and water quality is a huge issue. Um, just because it's a safety issue, people are getting sick. So where do you go to find the accurate information you need? The answer is you go to these places, but they're not really. I mean, the, the blue line and the red, no, the blue line and the green line are both government sources. And they both say very different. This lack of consistency and the lack of ground truthing of it, of uh, ability is a primarily primary problem. Um, and with something like water, which affects us very deeply because we need it every day, um, it makes it a little bit, it makes data um, more important and uh, the accuracy of data and how you collect it more. So. Um, um, so in uh, to con basically to conclude is that uh, there's a lot of gaps and we hope to there is a lot of work being done to hopefully fill those gaps um, the Planning Commission did ask for a group of people to write a report on water data uh, and the management of it and that report I have copies of it and it's available online on the Planning Commission site, did say that they stated some of these problems and recommended a lot of solutions. But it's yet to see how committed uh, government is to, to doing some of this data collection. And water is a state issue. So it's really up to the states to kind of decide how they want to test their water and keep track of it and provide access to it. Um, and keep track of what they're doing and how well they're doing it. Um, so in kind of to sum up, the data project hopes to like deal with a few of these problems. We can't do it all. Um, we're going to hopefully create some sort of framework for water data, seeing what what water data should what water data should exist, what does exist currently, and where are the gaps. Um, and hopefully, through looking at the water the data that exists now, creating visualizations, creating storytelling. Um, we can push people to do um, a little bit more robust data collection and find out some of the answers to the questions that people have. Like, is my water safe to drink? Because um, right now the data that's available doesn't actually tell you in a succinct way. So um, that is my spiel. Questions, comments? Are there any portable sensors for collecting data? Sorry? Portable measuring. So Sam, who is not in this room, is trying to um, create a sensor that you could hook up to your smartphone that would test water quality. But the kits are like, they're, they're not too expensive, right? You're supposed to get a kit from your government if you want to test your water. Um, in, a, in, a, in an urban setting, it's not too bad, but the rural setting tends to be a little bit more um, mixed. What about temporal data over time? Government does collect it pretty consistently over time. You can get, um, so on the Central Ground Water Board, you get up to 2009. You're not going to find anything past 2009 um, in terms of water quality or whatever. The, you might find on the Ministry of Drinking Water um, 2010 or 2011, but in terms of robust big data sets, you're not going to find anything uh, after 2009. So there's a there's a lapse uh, here. Um, Nizreen can actually correct me if that's not true. Government do collect data uh, continuously, they want it, but they publish it once and four. It's like CTWD has published 2004 one report, and then 2007 and eight they have published one report on groundwater quality data. So when we depend on the government when publish it, so still the report they have monitoring cells wells where they are collecting data from. And they're monitoring it regularly on the regular basis, but uh, it's not published and it's not in public. And it's not consistent. Oh, go on. Uh, you know, uh, I work in the area of waste management, and to some extent, I want to do something like this for waste and recycling and mm -hmm. stuff. So actually, I'm very interested in this session. Because uh, the only thing that I'm wondering is that I will be sourcing the data from government agencies as well as NGOs. So I currently am attached to an NGO mm -hmm. that services uh, waste related uh, services for uh, people who are not serviced by BBMP. So um, 
Well, how do you solve the copyright issues of data? Like, you know, the, I mean, for example, we service Google, for example. Will Google share the data so openly about its waste management and recycling? Do you have contracts? Do you enter into so, contracts? So, copyright is a question for Pranesh, but um, <laughs> we put up the MET data, the, the rainfall data, that we got not from government, but from another source okay. who got it from government. Okay and put it up and they haven't said a word to us to take it down. Um, copyright is something they don't go after unless you are going after something <coughs> that would kind of take money away from them. It's it's still kind of up in the air. Uh, there hasn't been a fight about it basically. It's still a gray area. So we, are, we operate under the uh, assumption that if you add value to the data, then it's okay to, to republish. Can you just add on to that? Just because I happen to know of it, they may not use copyright uh, against you um, if, if it's not a monetary issue, but if they have a concern about the data that's being used, mm -hmm. if they did some digging, they would be supported by copyright law perhaps in asking you to take it down. So, for example, you know, many times agencies may not like what you're doing with their data and they say stop doing it and say like, take our permission. If they don't have an actual right under any other law to say that. You, know, you need to take our permission, then yeah. they'll say copyright under copyright this is our data. It may not always be their data, yeah. but sometimes it might be. I mean, it's one hundred percent. It's a real law. Yeah, uh, they just, will go after uh, you, but they just to the add on to the copyrights of it, which I have personally <coughs> dealt with uh, quite a lot of countries in quite a Indian copyright laws are very very vague. Okay, that is one thing that I would I like to add on from the legal perspective. Like, even if it goes to court, it doesn't stand. Because quite a lot of my work, which were stolen over the period of uh, last year That's research data, which was stolen, I couldn't get it back thanks to Indian copyright laws. Oh. Okay, so the only time which where you have to be worried about governmental data or the uh, you know the public data is um, the only time which you really need to worry about is when you're misusing it and there is a lot of difference between using it and misusing it no, right? I'm not worried about government data right? Folks, because it's no, like any data I'm talking about sorry to interrupt you but just one bit of announcement uh, if anybody is interested in UADI I'm in the food court sure, sure. I'll be running it right. I'm worried about clients like these like RMZ Infinity hmm. is one of our clients like mm -hmm. you know we, uh, we do waste management for them so we have data on their recycling rates Hmm. Uh, across two years probably. That's but then, who, who collected it? We collected it. You collected it. Because we are collecting the waste and we are recycling it for them. So we have decided, yeah. But we haven't entered into a contract with RMZ Infinity apart from giving back to them the data that this is what's happening, this is what you're recycling. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that would depend on your contract. Yeah, that's yeah, what I'm that's thinking. Yeah. These things yeah. can be uh, built in in the contract yeah. which says after your work is done, like if RMZ has asked you to collect this data for certain project, Correct. so after once your project is done, we are free to use this data in any form. There is always a fair yeah, use policy. Yeah. All right, these things have to be contracts. You can still add on to the contract. Yeah. I mean, more better the your legal advisor if you have one can help you. <laughs> okay. And but other than that, uh, other than that, generally speaking, copyright is not a very huge issue in India at all. Yes. Okay. Yet, yeah, not yet. It's never. There are two things which never is never an issue. One is a privacy. And the second thing is the um, copyright. As a person who is a lawyer for companies, <laughs> I can tell you both hit you depending on who you offend. <laughs> no, so what I, what I, I mean, yeah, yeah. All the I mean, is the guys who have money. No, right? on, on this point, what would be interesting is what extrapolation you do on the data part of it. If you do very aggregate, aggregate data extrapolation, there is an argument made that you don't have to necessarily build in contractual terms on privacy. But for example, if you are doing waste approximation which allows you to determine what particular individuals or families or companies, what their personal so habits are, yeah. that might get you into situations. So if you see what some people do when they do this data correlation in other countries, they say that we, we perform these services for you. And one of the rights you give us is to do broad level data analysis over what you give us. Okay. That's what some people do. They, have, they build that into, that con, into their standard contract. Okay. That allows them to do basically data metrics, right? And many yeah. companies have that there in the yeah. That's about it. I will start adding that. <laughs> and I'm doing it. Is it that like if if if, if Nisha were, were to was to I mean were to do a story on this thing and you know put allegations on the government data, then they could do that, right? They could Maybe. Just, 
put it on here. Is that is that the kind of? It's scenario? unclear if this graph is a violation of their of their copyright. If the graph. Actually, no. I'm saying if you do a story and okay. this comes out in the in the public. So that depends on what she's using. For example, because Misha mentioned she's publishing data which they directly collecting. Uh, and it's arguable that it is a copyrightable work, then they could try and use it. But it depends a lot, and more importantly, she'll have to assert a public, she could assert a public use defense and say it's a, what's, what's the general term, fair use, we don't have that exactly in India, we have a different thing, but you could assert it, but they can use it. And they have occasionally used it in India, not so much, not very often, but in other countries, provisions of law very similar to ours, people have sometimes used it. That's a common reason, like if you're offending. <coughs> <There's anything, coughs> yeah. For example, copyright sometimes is enforced, but by and large, right, that they very rarely actually enforce it. They rarely except when they see a commercial, strong commercial thing, but they, if they are concerned that you're saying something which really offends them, one of the things they can assert is copyright because they do have it sometimes. Not always. There is a lack of clarity of what they will go after and what they won't, and what are the parameters of what they'll go after. At, at one level, data is not copyrightable so because it's not a work of creativity. Exactly, exactly. The data itself, but that's but only from the be. last few years. But tables can be copyrighted sometimes, okay. depending on what you're doing. So pure data is absolutely correct, but the way you express it, unfortunately, that's a hazy area. And you're right. In some other countries, for example, in the UK, they have instructions to government that you shall not, you shall not sue. When somebody does broad data collection based on government data, but there's no such you know order in India to government. I think it's like a matter of fighting it out in the courts or somewhere where where clarity has to be established, yeah. and they haven't gone after anyone uh, enough people to really cause that fight. You know, I mean that's like a, Isn't that something like it's also a good thing in a sense if you have a long established practice of government not going after people using it. Then when they do assert it, you can make this argument saying you did not do step in right. to enforce your rights for nearly a decade. But you have to convince a judge. A judge may not be convinced. But there is one more but thing. Was that it, I've heard isn't this a so part of our conversation right coming from the first event itself? Like you were there as well. Now we are seeing the government uh, what it's trying to do on on the internet privacy and censorship. Uh, with these kind of questions where the the term itself is not clear. So far. Uh, no, I mean, I'm saying this so copyright uh, these things of, are of data, like it's still unclear, like you're saying it's a hazy term. Like, shouldn't we as a group or maybe we should try to... You would. So, this is areas where besides having this general open data policy, it's besides even broader things there, we are actually convincing them to do data. You just ask them, don't sue us, make a commitment, okay. which you could. You could ask the copyright office to issue instructions okay. on this and that's completely doable. People have done that in other countries. For so, example, before the US came up with this open data policy, there were three or four years worth of advocacy where people just went and said convince the corporate office, the Department of Justice that okay. don't sue these people, even the US is public domain, but they said don't even enforce Freedom of Information Act things against them. You can do all of that, these incremental things that you can do, exactly why these conversations happen here, right? For you to and, outline what you... And if you ask government for data, they usually will be like, they will say to you, don't, this is not the public, this is just you know, because they want that power to be like, I know you, you're going to be nice to me and do a nice thing and not use data to be mean to me and here you go. And like, and that's kind of the, they have to figure out if they can trust you with the data and they'll say, don't, don't put it up online. They'll give it to you or they'll sell it to you, which is even worse. If they sell it to you and you can't put it up, that's kind of their like revenue generation. And so there's the, what, how, how do we incentivize them to share and then allow us to share? And that incentivization process just doesn't exist. So they'll go after copyright whenever they see something. You know? One thing to also remember is they're very often not themselves clear about what their actual rights are or permission. For example, very often a department may get information, but they always believe that they need to get permission from somebody else to share. They're not actually clear themselves. This is it goes both ways. Right, risk aversion. Risk aversion, and it's actually too risk aversion because. For some of them, they're worried about how they can enforce it. For other people, they're afraid that they will be subject to sanction later. So that's why when you ad advocate externally, you're saying that, make this clear for everyone. It's also clear for government, which is exactly what I think you may have heard other people on the, on the Data Meet group talk about the NSDAP, the National Sa Sharing and Data Accessibility Policy, and documents like that. It's good for government also, because government can't share data amongst each other. The government has great data, which they can't share across departments, because they're wondering half the time who has to get permission send it across. So it's value for them also to know these things that a copyright sometimes doesn't apply or that you can share it. Obama answered it simply by doing one thing, by saying the general position is that you can share it. 
and issued it as an executive direction under his office for gender cross. In India, the cabinet secretary did the same thing, so it had the same effect. It can be done. So I want to just add because he says something very nice, which is great data. Did you say great data? Mm-hmm. Well, if you didn't, then I am imagining it. <laughs> because I'm thinking in this waste management, uh, there's a lot of grey market. Like there's a lot of illegal recycling market that doesn't come under the legality of the government. If I con- <coughs> if I collect the demographics of the recycling workers, which are in, it's a completely informal industry in Jolly Mahalla, wherever in Bangalore, then it's completely things that are not mapped yet or something. You know, the, uh, the government is not very excited to know that there are like you not know, fifteen thousand waste pickers in this city. Uh, stuff like that. So this data is actually very nice to have been put up somewhere and to be accessible somewhere. And it's not validated by any uh, legal standing. You know? Everybody under downplays it. Companies like this overplay. Like you know, if your recycling rate is X, they want it to be X plus something. You know, right. things like that. So in in our sector and this sector, the data is always you have to be very um, uh, astute in. Uh, coming out with uh, analysis in that. So, which is why I have issues about, ethic, you know, ethical issues about data sharing in mm. this sector, which I don't know if you've faced in those. Uh, a little bit. We have, we talked about it briefly. I mean, we should have done a session on ethics, but hopefully we can talk about it on the Google group, if everyone joins, um, and kind of, because it's, it's a hard question to answer, and I wish Pranesh was in this session with me, because he can, he is really good at answering these kinds of things. It's that there are, he said, what did he say yesterday? There are also always harms that can come out of data, um, and open data in particular. There, there are harms that can happen, and that you have to think about them. Um, so, if you have a list of how many people are scavenging and doing the waste workers, you know that's not. I mean, that could be a controversial list, or that could cause something to someone. You know, but it is a good thing to know, right? Like. And how, where is that balance, and what do you what do you do? Yeah. So with water data, like the data on uh, the Department of Drinking Water and Sanitation, which they have a lot of data and they update it fairly frequently, has been pretty informally said that the data is not good because comparing it to baseline data done by NGOs in certain areas, the data is blatantly false. So for instance, in the Northeast. The data in government sites will say the arsenic level is much lower than it actually is. Um, and it's these types of problems that can kind of cause, you know, well, what is, what, what exactly is the level? So for, for that kind of situation, you go, well, of course, you would share the data and then your, your baseline data to find out what exactly is the arsenic level. But there is a whole political reason why that arsenic level on the government side is lower than it might be in an actual reading. You know, it might not be a methodology issue. There's politics behind data. There's power behind data. Um, so you can never know the, there are unforeseen consequences in, in sharing. But the, if you start with sharing is good and then kind of work back from there, then I think that's okay. Uh, what is a negative consequence you don't want to happen? Like, do you privatize or um, how do you protect for privacy? Um, I don't really have the answers to these. I'm just kind of talking off the top of my head right now. But it's it's a it's an interesting question that has to come out um, at some point. And I think right now it's kind of a decision that people are making on their own and not really making as a community or as a united voice about something. No one's really talking about it in a formal way. Um, it's basically not. We have like 10 minutes, so any more questions? We can show something else. AJ, if you want to go through Jaw map. There's a map we... <clears throat> Friends of mine uh, from Stanford, they're Indian researchers working on water sanitation issues. So they want to help <coughs> in setting up a map to crowdsource this data. So <coughs> I'm a tech guy who just uses USAID a lot. So I help them set this up. And there is no data because it was just launched the uh, day before yesterday or yesterday. So, yeah. So if you, uh, if you show the, the header, yeah. So reports about water sanitation issues, 
So Ushayadi is a good uh, crowdsourcing tool which lets you aggregate data through the website, SMS, Twitter, and there are apps for it. We have set up SMS also. As you see on the right side, there are categories where you can report issues with what tab, pump, streams, <coughs> and river wells, sewage, and defecation problems, or garbage. So basically, water and sanitation issues. So yeah, so this data is, I mean, this is an effort to crowdsource this data to citizens. So, so let's see how it goes. Have you subcategorized these categories, like in wells, what type of data? No, not yet. I mean, uh, they are still working on it. Like, if you have any suggestions, so we'll be happy to do that because uh, I, I'm just handling the tech part, and uh, this thing is planned by them. So you can always write to like suggest something because it's still in the process. So it would be nice to have subcategories, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you talk about wells, you want to measure the water quality of the well, the yeah. water level of the well, the location of the well, and the type of well it is. It's a tube right. well, a dug well, or a hand well. Right. So all those things. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just take it up and I'll just I'll communicate it to them. Thank you. Okay, there are no more questions. It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a wrap. Thank you all for coming.